Hi, this is Stuart Weems and thanks for listening to the Investopoly podcast. My goal is to give you simple, easy to understand insights, strategies and tips to help you master the game of building wealth. And in this episode, what I'd like to talk about is a couple of bits of data and research that has been released in the past over the past week, uh, which we can read into and perhaps apply to our own situation. So the first thing I want to talk about is variable mortgage rates. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what the RBA might do and then also what the banks might do independently. So of interest is the change in interbank lending rates. So that's the rates at which banks can lend to each other. Uh, this is called the, the bank bill swap rate and it can be for over certain periods of times. So it can be 90 days, it can be six months and so forth depending on the term. And it's a benchmark rate that's used in uh, lots of lending, particularly commercial lending, but also interbank between banks. It really determines the bank's cost of funds. So that is, if the bank needs to fund mortgages, one way it can do that is by mon- borrowing money on the short-term money market, and the rate at which it pays will be set according to the typically 30 or 90-day bank bill swap rate. Now, these rates have been going up recently. So then the difference between the bank bill swap rate and the cash rate, which is really the risk-free rate, has um, extended by about 0.3 of a percent, or what they say is 30 basis points. Um, this means essentially that the bank's cost of funds has increased. You know, their ability, the cost to provide a mortgage to you on variable rates has increased. And about one-third to almost one-quarter in that range of the bank's funding is based on short-term money market lending or linked to short-term money market lending. So whilst that cost has increased by about 30 points, uh, only uh, a quarter to one-third of their fu- of their book or, or funding platform is impacted. Therefore, it's estimated that the bank's cost of funds have increased by about 10 basis points or 0.1 of uh, 1%. Um, as such, we've seen second-tier lenders such as ING, Bank of Queensland, IMB, uh, which is Illawarra Mutual Building Society, Citibank and Bank SA, which is really St George or Bank of Melbourne, and ME Bank, which is uh, run by the industry super funds. That, these second-tier lenders have all increased variable interest rates and they've cited increasing in funding costs as a reason for doing that. Now, the big banks, the big four, have an increased variable uh, mortgage rates yet, but it's something to keep in mind, in the back of our mind, that this this is bubbling on behind the scenes. I think the reason why they have an increased rates is because obviously it will attract a lot of negative publicity when they don't really need it. The, the Royal Commission's already attracting enough negative publicity for them. Uh, and also, there's a first mover disadvantage. So, you know, the first big four bank to change rates will probably cop most of the brunt of the negative media. So they're probably just waiting out, uh, waiting for someone else to move. Uh, What does it mean for you and me? Well, as mortgage holders, uh, if we have variable rate products, we've got to expect that this is on the horizon. So we might be listening to all the rhetoric around the RBA that they're not going to move rates. Uh, but that's not to say rates won't change. Uh, the other thing as well is then um, considering if you're weighing up fixed rates versus variable, uh, I'd be adding an extra 10 basis points to the current variable rate when you make that comparison of whether it's worth uh, locking in. The second uh, bit of commentary or, or meter commentary in the last week or so has been about the impending or a looming potential credit risk of um, uh, Australian borrowers that are on interest-only home loans or interest-only investment loans that are about to flick over or, or might be expiring soon and changing to principal interest. And a lot of the media has been surmising about, you know, what is the impact on the market and credit risk and so forth. Because if we tip over, tip across to principal interest repayments, that's obviously going to put pressure on household cash flow. Uh, and then will that will that result in a rise in the default rate? So uh, putting aside the macroeconomic commentary, you know, if you just in regards to your specific situation, if you have loans, interest-only loans that are coming towards the end of the interest-only period and you can check your loan agreement or ring your bank to find out when that is or speak to your broker, 
If they're coming up, uh, say, within the next year or so, then you might start thinking about making some moves now and, and either looking to whether you can reset your interest-only term with your existing lender or whether you have to refinance to a new lender to get a brand new interest-only term, which is typically five years. Uh, that's the length of the interest-only term these days. Uh, I'd be doing that sooner rather than later, just in case there's any uh, future changes or, or more credit tightening that uh, might restrict your ability to do that. Lastly on interest rates is the Reserve Bank. Uh, CPI inflation figures were out, uh, released on Wednesday of this week. Uh, and uh, in relation to the um, June quarter. Uh, inflation was up at uh, now annualised at, at 2.1%, which is in the RBA's band, albeit towards the end of the bottom of the band, the 2 to 3%. That's their their um, instructions to, to keep inflation within that band. Uh, but most of the price increase, most of the stimulus within inflation was as a result of fuel petrol prices. So um, whereas food and uh, rent and so forth, uh, there was some deflation in those numbers. Uh, so really, ostensibly looking through the numbers, uh, it's pretty benign. Uh, inflation's ticking upwards, but at a very, very slow rate. Uh, wage inflation is, uh, is, is somewhat absent, and on a like-for-like -like basis, we estimate that it's around about 1%, which is, uh, which is really low. Uh, so until those numbers start to really pick up, we can't see the RBA moving interest rates. Um, and so that's probably at least for the rest of this calendar year and maybe into uh, 2019 as well, or, or maybe for the full 2019. So that's enough about lending. Let's talk about super funds and super performance. So Chant West, uh, a researcher, released their top 10 uh, super performers and uh, there was no little absence of the retail funds so they're all industry funds in the top 10. No surprises there given the Productivity Commission has also indicated through its research that retail funds tend to be uh, tend to have very high fees and very poor performance and the median difference between industry and retail funds over the last 12 months has been about 1.3 percent. So if you're, in, if you're in a retail fund, such as AMP, Colonial, BT, MLC, they're probably the, the big four. Uh, if you're in one of those funds, uh, my general advice would be uh, to try and get out of there and get into a lower cost environment because you're probably getting hit by both sides, low returns and, and uh, high fees. Um, the best performing fund over the last 12 months was Host Plus, its own balanced fund, although its um, interim returns, they, ha they haven't finalised their return for the end of the year, at 12.5%. Um, uh, interesting that the, the uh, low-cost index model portfolio that we use to invest our client, Super, uh, performed at 11 0.52%, uh, which puts a second in that top 10 table, which is, uh, which is pleasing that a rules-based, low-cost indexed uh, proven evidence-based approach uh, is is has performed very well in the last uh, 12 months because uh, index funding index investing won't always beat all the active managers out there. Of course, not in every year. Uh, so that's uh, very good. But uh, the problem and the reason for me mentioning is that quite often uh, we get seduced. Sometimes we get seduced by these tables, thinking, "Well, Host Plus performed the best, so we I need to switch my super to Host Plus." But um, that's, whilst that's tempting, it's not necessarily the best way to compare super funds. So really, I think there's three things that we need to look at. The first thing we need to look at is past performance. So is there a track record of delivering um, strong returns on a consistent basis compared to the market and compared to their peers as well? So you want to make sure they've got the runs on the table. The second item to consider when choosing a fund is fees. Fees are certain, investment returns are not, they're uncertain. So the best way you can reduce your risk of picking the wrong fund is by picking the fund with the lowest fees. Uh, that's not to say that all you focus on is fees and ignore returns and investment methodology, which I'll get to in a second. The third is, is will history repeat itself? So, okay, it's got low fees and good historic returns, but what evidence do we have that history will, will repeat itself? And for you to be able to draw that conclusion, what you need is uh, to invest in a fund that has high transparency and high accountability. So you kind of understand how they're investing 
how they have invested in the past, what their methodology is, and is it repeatable and is it rules-based. Um, and that's what you need to, to be able to really determine and to work out. You know, if we sit there and look at the table, will Host Plus be, be number one next year? Well, I'd argue there's actually not enough transparency and accountability for us to be able to work out or draw a conclusion there. I'd like to finally leave on one point, and that is that the industry funds, uh, most of them or a lot of them have an indexed option. And as we know from the research that I've done in Investopoly, and certainly there's a lot of blogs on our website, is that the um, the overwhelming data suggests that uh, in the long run, index beats active management. Whereas in the industry fund sector, as you'll see in the in the show notes within this podcast, uh, they haven't performed very well uh, in the last 12 months. And my view on this is that most of the index funds index option, uh, sorry, industry funds index options are almost designed to fail. That is that they're, um, they're, they've got very basic construction and they only use one indexing type, which is market cap indexing. So they are very, very basic. And I think they're a bit of a loss leader. You know, hey, we've got this option and it's very low cost. Uh, but if it's going to deliver really low performance, so for example, Host Plus's indexed uh, option uh, produced only 7% return, whereas its normal balance 12.5%. So it's great to save fees, but not if it's going to cost you 5.5% in, in total returns. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. So if you're an industry fund, um, my view now is that you um, should probably switch to a balanced or growth option, albeit that they're actively managed. Um, I think there's a big conflict of interest in the industry fund sector about moving to index because if we all move to index it means that they need to employ a whole lot less people um, and uh, given that they're run by the unions uh, that's not about to happen anytime soon. All right so that's just a bit on uh, lending and super. Uh, Hope that's uh, of interest. Uh, Until next week, bye for now.